Well, hello. It's uh, another Wednesday, uh, and you're going to hear garbage trucks today because Wednesday is my trash day. Uh, it is good to see you, and uh, we're getting rain here in California. It's um, pretty intense, which it always used to be when I was a kid. It was a downpour uh, in uh, November, usually. We got a good soaking. Um, and now we have it, and people are freaking out because of the fires. Um, and uh, that's here we are. It's our it's our winter. <laughs> um, and I thought today um, I would talk about structuring the novel. I was on a panel at AWP uh, on uh, the shape of fiction, structuring the novel, and people really wanted to, information about the subject. Now, structuring is not um, something that uh, everybody is interested in playing with, uh, but all novels have structure. I mean, even if you just build a pile of wood, it's going to have a structure of some sort. So, um, uh, happy now ruse too. <laughs> and it's now ruse. Okay, very cool. Um, so, uh, you know, how do I structure a novel? Let's start with me. Um, I My last novel was chronological. It was an historical novel. Um, and chronological novel single point of view um, tends to be historical or mystery. Um, it has a linear narrative uh, because people are likely to get lost uh, if you write a historical novel from um, a more innovative point of view. Uh, you could get really lost. Um, so it suggested its own form. Um, my normal method uh, or way of styling a, a of forming a piece of prose. I like uh, to work associationally where it's almost like a musical motif where something comes up that reminds the character of something else and then you go into that. Um, there is um, a staggering number of ways to structure a novel. Um, the way I guess uh, I structure uh, my work is also, I'm very uh, aud auditory, and so you could also say that it's a musical uh, method of structuring. I like to um, have variation, just like you were composing an opera or you're composing a symphony. You want your highs and then you want to follow, what am I following it with? It's like making a good mixtape. Uh, I want to have, um, say, a, a scene, a crowd scene, and I'd like to follow that with a, say, two-person scene, or a one-person scene, or three people. Uh, I'd like to go from a, 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 a indoor scene to an outdoor scene. I'd like to go from a, a night scene to a day scene. It's always changing it up, changing it up. And I'm looking for that rise and fall. I'm looking for that... Um, that variation. Uh, so even if I could say, you know, I don't really structure my novels, uh, so to speak, there is a structure. Structure emerges. And when you read, you should be looking for how, you know, how your writer is telling the story that you're reading, not just chowing down, you know. How are they unfolding it? Is it chronological? Does it move around? present and past. Um, so the chronological novel, the very, very simple structure that you can do a lot of things inside of it. Um, and then I would say uh, the second type of novel is what I would call the Rashomon novel. Uh, if nobody, if anybody hasn't seen Rashomon, um, very famous Japanese film, um, Kurosawa film, where a group of people have seen the same event, but everyone sees something different. Everybody sees it differently. Everyone remembers it differently. Um, and that's a glorious structure. Um, it's a psychological form. 
because it's saying that no two people have the same outlook on an event. Um, and you can, it's a, it's a journey of point of view. So you go into all these people and you see a single event from many points of view. And um, it would be a cool way of handling a mystery novel. Um, novels told through two points of view, you can see as a Rashomon novel. Um, Fates and Furies, Husband and Wife, Lauren Groff's book, Husband and Wife, um, it operates definitely uh, as a Rashomon uh, type of novel. Um, then I would say a third type of novel, which is a very helpful one for the read for the writer, something that really will uh, help hold your hand and help you through the venture, is what I'm calling what I call a braided novel, and that's where you follow one person's story. Uh, say you're going along with Joe and Joe is talking about you know how he's getting ready for the dance and really excited and then he goes to the dance and he sees and something happens to him at this dance and then there'll be another character maybe in the dance maybe from some other part of the book Marsha and you've played out all you can do with Joe all you you know all you've got and then you braid it, and then Martha comes in, and Martha, or Marsha, what did I call her? Marsha starts telling her story, and you can move the, the, um, uh, the progress of the story down the road, because you can move ahead with each new character you introduce, and then you tell it from that point of view, until you get done with however Marsha, however much Marsha can, can convey to you. And then, oh, here's Samantha. And you can give Martha, Marsha and Joe a rest and bring in Samantha's story. And that takes you further down the line until Joe is sort of recovered or his story or whatever's going to happen to him has brought back some oomph. And then you can bring Joe back. And it weaves these stories back and forth. So that is a really helpful uh, form for the novelist. That really gives you a hand. Um, I'm always looking for things that help you so you don't have to push the locomotive up the hill, that, that uh, the story itself, the book itself, uh, does some <laughs> plot twist, Martha is Marsha. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> um, so these, each narrative strand advances the novel as a whole. And um, it's... Uh, the Poisonwood Bible. I actually brought books with me. I have books all over the house, so my my uh, prime novels are downstairs. So the Poisonwood Bible, and I'm going to switch this so you can see it. Here we go. And there's the Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsolver. Um, it is a really remarkable book, uh, a book of point of view where she has, I believe it is six points of view, all told from the first person, um, except for, I believe, the mother, which is third person. And everyone has their own point of view on the events as they unfold. And they're woven in so that the reader experiences a forward motion of the events of the story. But we get them from such distinct points of view that each chapter is actually named for someone, like here's Leah, her section. But it gets to the point that the voices are so clear and vivid and the points of view are so strong, what each character's issues are, that you almost don't need the name on them anymore because you can tell whose story we're in. And this is a, a masterful novel, if you haven't read it. But watch how she does what she does. Um, the Hours by Michael Cunningham, another brilliant book told in the braided, braided style. There are three points of view and three different um, chronologies. So the uh, three points of view... Um, Virginia Woolf in uh, the early part of the century, 
a woman in the 50s, kind of trapped as wife and mother, and a contemporary woman who has overtones of Mrs. Dalloway, which is the Virginia Woolf story, and <coughs> of Virginia Woolf, who, Mrs. Dalloway, which is being read by the woman in the 50s. So there is a motif that connects them, which I love, and we move back and forth between these stories, uh, which don't move just forward in time, but you can see how they connect until we get to the point where they begin to converge. That's a beautiful way to tell a story. <coughs> Still have residual cough, as I'm sure half of the people watching uh, have right now. And then... Um, there can be two parts, present and past, like A.S. Byatt's Possession, or a novel form that I'm going to call the Sargasso Manuscript novel. And if anybody has not seen the movie The Sargasso Manuscript, uh, it is a, an adventure tale where somebody starts to tell a story of an adventure, and then you go in to the tale and you're part of that adventure and then someone within that story starts to tell a story <clears throat> and then you go into their story and they start to tell and then you're you're experiencing their story and then someone in that story starts telling another story and you go down seven layers inside story inside story inside story and then they bring you out seven layers i mean that is masterful. And you'll start to notice the Cloud Atlas, you know, is sort of a Sargasso manuscript type of form. And then there are more innovative novels where form becomes not just a vehicle, but begins to shape the novel itself. And uh, <coughs> I... Um, will uh oh here's another uh, before i get there here was another kind of uh serial serial novel now this is the alexandria quartet this is one of my probably my favorite novels on earth alexandria quartet by uh lawrence durrell or durrell if you're english and these are the four novels, Justine, Balthazar, Mount Olive, and Clea. And they are remarkable. This is a remarkable novel. First, the guy writes like an angel. Like an angel. Take a look at those sentences. Start with Justine. And Justine is a story told from the point of view of someone in during World War II looking back at the interwar period in um, uh, Alexandria. And it's very much a social novel, talks about the high life, the low life, and every life in between, from this guy's point of view, Darley. Balthazar, the second volume, he sends Justine, this is the conceit, sends Justine to his friend Balthazar in Alexandria. Balthazar writes back to him and says, oh, see, you're really an idiot. What you, there's so much you didn't know about what was going on when you were writing that book, that I'm going to tell you what was really going on. So it interlineates. Yeah, the Balthazar's crack spine. Uh, this was a cheaper, obviously, uh, uh, the mass market version. I've lost my Balthazar. I don't know how. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so Balthazar is, that's the Rashomon. Balthazar goes back and is going to explain to you what this guy, what he missed in the first book. Mount Olive goes back a generation to show you how the event, the, the seeds of the events that happened in these first books took place. And then Clea is a very clear-headed person, contemporary, who knows all of these other stories. So this I would call, um, uh, I mean, there's many a couple of different forms involved here. Uh, the prequel, the uh, the Rashomon, um, the 
This is a, a first person looking back. And then this, again, another Rashomon character. But we trust Clea more, less unreliable. Um, let's see who do we have next. And then there is the Motival novel. Now, this is one of my other favorites. So anybody who knows me knows Durrell and Lowry. This is Under the Volcano, one of the great books. One of the great books. It is about written about the Day of the Dead in uh, 1939 in Mexico, so the eve of the war, of World War II. Uh, places paranoid, spies, fascists, you know. And it is the the cons British consul in Cuernavaca um, is drinking himself to death on the Day of the Dead. And it is the most glorious book, and it is told, I call it the spiral novel. It's told associationally or motivally, which is what I like uh, best of all things, where there are images that recur and reoccur and reoccur uh, in the book. They start out very small. Uh, a word would be tossed out, an image, um, uh, the poster, uh, uh, Las Manos de Orlock, uh, The Hands of Orlock. It's a horror film with Peter Lorre. And every time it's mentioned in the book, it gains, we gain more understanding of what it means in the story, what the implications are. So when he sees it, we get a bigger and bigger charge. There's a, there's a theme, a, a motif, a, a Oaxaca. The first time he uses it, he says, um, he just said that somebody, somebody was going to Oaxaca. You don't think anything of it. Forty pages later, he says, Oaxaca is the saddest word. It's like, what? You go on, and then you see... Oaxaca meant divorce. You know, that's 20, 30, 40 pages later. And suddenly, you know, not suddenly, but gradually, these images, and there are hundreds of them, and they're repeated over and over, and they gain density and meaning, and the story begins to turn around like a big spiral using all these motifs, and they have this energy that pulling them towards the center, towards some terrible thing that's going to happen. Uh, there's obsessions. <coughs> there's a repetition of this this um, barranca, which is like a canyon or like a fissure that runs through the, through the town. And boy, you know, if that's not symbolic. And he, this drunk is always in danger of falling into it. Um, there are these stray dogs that follow around the feral dogs big motif, um, but hundreds of them. And they pull towards the center, towards the center, towards the center, until the whole thing just explodes. I mean, it is the most glorious book. It is glorious. If you haven't read Under the Volcano, I highly recommend it. And mark it up. Note, all, note the motifs. Note what he's doing. Um, it, is, it is absolutely stellar. Then, let's see, what happened? What so then we get into the more innovative forms. Um, the Markson, a guy named David Markson, he also works in a motival way. He takes a theme and will replay it and pick it up in different aspects. So here is my favorite Markson. He's written a lot of them. And this is called Vanishing Point. Many of them are um, usually they're they're literary. They're comments about literature, about culture, and let me take give you a look at these. Okay, see, it's just single sentences, or sometimes a little group of sentences that will pick up a theme over and over and over again. Um, so you start to not you don't so much read a book like this you don't so much read a book like this as assemble a book like this. it assembles in the reader's mind as the repetitions take on weight 
you remember what they said about Schiller, and here we are again talking about Rilke, and it's like, oh, um, that makes sense. You know, Whistler did not get married until he was 54. That means nothing to us now, but if we're reading the book, somebody either got married at a different age, and there's a theme going on here. It's very obsessional. I love obsession. Because uh, what's art but obsession, right? Um, or it could be uh, facts about Whistler that start to gain in your mind. So you start to intuit a larger story from these fragments. There's another writer who, a book that does this, and I just love it, called Ava by Carol Mazo. Her books are always interesting, uh, formally. Ava, autographed by Carol Mazo. And uh, this book, again, is told in the same way. This is a dying woman who is remembering things, uh, kind of like somebody drifting in a morphine fog and is remembering bits and pieces. It is more of a story than... It's more of a story than the Marxian. He, he's trying to bring a, a picture of culture and certain cultural problems into your head, whereas this is an actual story about a dying woman and the things that go through her head, where she is, how she's reacting to what's going on in her room, memories, thoughts about dying, thoughts about life. It's a beautiful book. Um, here's another one told in an interesting way. This is somebody I know, that's a good friend, uh, Mary Rakow, in a book called The Memory Room. And she also, she, this was a very long um, novel that she found, um, she found this, no, she found the material really overwhelming. It's a very difficult story, um, psychological trauma. And what she did, she went and saw a uh, an art show of the artist uh, Julian Schnabel, who had the broken paintings, uh, broken plates in his, embedded in the paint. He was a big uh, a writer in the tw in the artist in the eighties, and now he's making films. But what she realized is she could break the plates of her narrative, and have little what she would call dots, just little pieces of the narrative, almost like poems, but they're not, you know, they're not poems. But they're very, a lot of white space were just little pieces of the story that she realized she didn't have to write it contiguously. She could just take discrete moments. You know, for two days and nights, the white rectangle on my glass table hasn't changed. Doesn't change. But this is somebody going through some emotional trauma, I mean, tr deep emotional trauma. So that is a moment that she wants you to stop and consider. This was a beautiful way of telling a book, uh, of telling a different, difficult story without, you know, having to drag us through every second of it. Um, Then another single sentence, you know, we have these little novels like Ava, which is these little single sentences that build. Then you have the opposite. You have Marquez's The Autumn of the Patriarch. And The Autumn of the Patriarch is a simple, is one single sentence. There's no periods. That's a, that's a page. There's no paragraphs, there's no periods, there's, there's uh, commas. And it's funny that you can read this and start to realize that the breath, as you're reading it, that you naturally pause at certain places and that you don't need the periods. That books like this teach you how to read them while you're reading them. Uh, a book like um, like David Foster Wallace's um, Infinite Jest. I don't know if anybody has ever tried to read this. Um, but it has footnotes. It has like sometimes half the page is 
footnotes. And you're going, well, how do I read this? Do I read the text and then I read the footnote? Or should I get all the way to the end of the chapter uh, in the text and then go back and read all the footnotes? Or should I just read all the text and go back and read all the footnotes in the whole book? Well, uh, David Foster Wallace wrote a, a book that was somewhat longer than twice the length of Infinite Jest. And he didn't want to cut anything. <laughs> So what he did was he took a fair amount of the book and he wrote it as footnotes. So that book doesn't tell you how to read it. It doesn't tell you, do I start here, do I start here, should I go back, should I go forward. It's up to the reader to decide how they want to read the book. And when you start getting into these more interesting, playful forms, you, you have to decide how to read them. The, the book itself teaches you how to read them. Otherwise, you, you're going, what? I am lost. And allow yourself to be lost a little bit, but keep that writer's cap on. How, what are they doing? What are they doing? Um, here's another book that teaches you how to read it. Uh, you have to teach yourself how to read it. This, this is a visual novel. Um, written by Mark Danielewski, who has become um, uh, almost his own publishing house. He he composes his his stuff himself. He sets the type. He does the art. He basically delivers camera ready to his publisher, because there it's all about the visual. So House of Leaves. What is a House of Leaves? A House of Leaves, of course, is a book, right? And the house is in the book is is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, which is a mystery. But take a look. I just want you to take a look at this. Oh, okay. Here's some of it. Here's a little diary form, you know, like a courier type. Then there are book pages like this with one line on them at the bottom. Look at this. This it's. There's a poem. This is a haunted house story. This is a horror book. Then these are there's footnotes. How do I read? How do I read it? There's footnotes. There's this is a is a typesetter's heaven. This is uh, there are sections that you read this way. Then this is upside down. You read that way. And then this is like a whole. There's here sideways. I mean, think of the typesetting. And then this is a hole, and it reads through, so it's also on the back. Look at that. Now, what would you do with a form like that? What kind of a story would you write if you were going to play with type like this? 